So what I've been trying to cover in these classes with you is, you've all had the Baltimore Catechism or some catechism, and you've had to memorize the questions. What I'm trying to do is to put it in a, give you a practical use for it. You're going out there into a pagan world, and it is a pagan world. And you're going to have to pull on what you've learned in catechism and apply it to the life around you. And you may not really, un not even not understand, but you might not even be aware that what other people are saying to you is a pagan viewpoint. If you don't understand how to put what you learned in catechism into practice. So we looked at the question of why bad things happen to people because that, that's a question that's asked out there in the world all the time. Now let's look at some of the other things. The first thing you have to start to do is to use the intelligence that God gave you. God gave us as human beings some very special gifts. Free will is one of them. A soul is definitely, and sanctifying grace are definitely right at the top of the list. But one of the things that he gave you that separates you from animals is that you have the ability to reason. And you need to use that power. You need to develop it. Um, as, as you grow up, you go through different stages. And you are past the stage, you are at a stage where what they call you can synthesize information. You can take it apart and put it back together. You need to do that. You need to learn how to do that. Because out there in the world, in the real world, you're going to have teachers, because most of you are not out of school yet, and especially on the college level, the high school and college level. You're going to have teachers that will be giving you a lot of garbage. And if you don't learn to use your brain, you won't recognize it as garbage. You have to learn to think and to think for yourself and then take responsibility for those actions. Put them into, into use and not go by what your peers are doing. Because, again, your peers are influenced by that paganism in the world there. And you have to stand out. You have to be different. And you have to be willing to be different. So the first thing we're, go we're going to look at is, well, philosophy and religion. What's the difference between the two of them? Philosophy is reasoning. It's just thinking. It's understanding and coming to a conclusion based purely on Logic, deductive reasoning, like Sherlock Holmes. Um, Aristotle, he was a famous pagan. Uh, but, and St. Thomas at one time made the um, statement, what a Catholic I could have made out of you. Because he used his, he used logic, but he, logic only takes you so far. And so let's see how far logic will just take you. The, I told you when we were going through why bad things happen to good people that later we would, we would discuss what, when we were talking about God, um, why there, how can you prove that there is a God? In a pagan world, you're going to meet a lot of people who don't believe there is a God. So how can you prove logically that there is a God? There are at least half a dozen, if not more, ways to prove it. But let's, I'm just going to cover four of the, the most, uh, I would say the most important, but the most used ones. The first one is, every human being wants to be happy. Do you know of anybody who doesn't want to be happy? It's innate. It's part of your nature. You want to be happy. So the very fact that you have an idea that you want to be happy means that there should be, there is a, a goal then that you can achieve. And so the fact that you can't find happiness here in this world, you can look your whole life and you'll never be completely happy. You'll always be wanting something else. You, you achieve this happiness and then you want something more. That means that this creative world, if this creative world isn't giving you happiness, there has to be something beyond it. <clears throat> so therefore, there has to be a God. Um, the second and most obvious answer is just looking at the universe itself. 
look at the order in the universe. Look at the fact that the moon rotates around the sun, the sun rotates around, uh, um, rotates around the earth, the earth rotates around the sun, the two never collide. We have four seasons depending upon where we are in that rotation. Uh, the, the sun rises, the sun sets on a regular basis. Uh, we don't collide with any other, other the other uh, planets that are rotating around the sun. You can, you can start out in the universe and go down to the smallest plant. The, the, the certain pine trees, if you dig them up and plant them in, an, in, in another place, they won't grow. Why? Because there's certain microorganisms in the roots of the, that they've gotten used to where they were planted that you didn't take with you when you moved the, moved the tree. I mean, things as simple as that. Uh, there is so much in the, the cells in the human body, how you hear. All the cells that make up the process of hearing or seeing. Uh, we still don't know how nerves trans transmit information to the brain that the brain can translate into thoughts. We don't know how that works. And yet, we're supposed to believe that it all just happened. You know, there was a big bang in somewhere back in time and that threw cosmic dust out into the, into the, the universe and that all evolved into you. Uh, you can take a whole bunch of trash and put it in a pile and it won't just over time become a radio. And yet you're supposed to believe that happened in the universe? No. It, the fact that there's so much harmony and order in the universe means it had, there's a design. It had to be, there had to be a designer who planned it did just happen. It planned it. I, I'm, I can give you, you'll find very, very few really good um, scientists who are actually atheists, you'll find very few of them, because if they really know what they're doing. But this is, uh, one of them that I had in college was going in biology about what the water molecule. And the water molecule is, you know, H2O. It's one, one oxygen molecule and two hydrogen molecules. And they, they're like that. They're not like this. You would think they should be. They're, they're, they're lined up, they always line up like this. And that gives the, the water molecule certain characteristics that a lot of other molecules don't have. And for example, water is one of the few um, liquids that is actually lighter as a solid. Most, most liquids, let's say iron, in its liquid state is heavier than um, in, its, in its solid state. In its solid state, it's, as a powder, it's rather light, but when it's liquid and it binds, it becomes harder where water is actually lighter. That's why ice floats. If ice didn't float, what would happen over time? Let's say the ocean, the, the surface of the ocean would freeze. Well, it's a big body of water, but let's say a lake would freeze and that ice would melt and go to the bottom. Where it would take a lot longer to melt than if it were floating at the top. And over time, the bottom of the, the, the pond would become like ice upon ice upon ice until the whole pond was frozen and it wouldn't fall. And we would have a per permanent ice age. But God built this into water that is actually lighter and it floats and therefore it melts very quickly. This other, uh, water has, I think about 10, it's, it's, it's about five different exceptions to most of the rules. But it, that, it's because it's like this, and the other way. So there had to be a designer for that. That means there has to be a God. Um, another thing that all of you have from, the, from your, and all human beings have, 
is when you do something wrong, and I don't mean just, you know, you made a mistake in spelling. When you do something morally wrong, you told a lie, you feel guilty. It's called a conscience. Human beings have a conscience. That conscience had to be put into you by someone. The very fact that you morally, you feel that, that you've done something morally wrong means that you are going to, you, guilt means, whenever you're guilty of, you feel guilty for something, you feel guilty because you're gonna get punished. Even if it's a secret sin, even if it was a sin that you did and nobody else saw you, you feel guilty about it. You shoplifted in the store and you got away with it. Nobody saw you. You still feel guilty. That means you feel that there is somebody going to punish you. And it's not your parents. It's not the law. So who is it? It's God. It's in you from the very beginning. So therefore, there has to be someone that you feel deep down morally uh, subject to who's going to punish you for the good you do uh, reward you for the good you do and punish you for the bad. That's why even bar, even if you go back in history to the to cavemen, the Neanderthal man, we know that he believed in God. He buried his dead. You wouldn't bury your dead if you didn't believe in an afterlife. And the, and the, probably the major reason that most people use to prove that there is a God is what's called causality, the first cause. Everything you can trace back, everything that's made, you can trace back to somebody made it. And, you know, who made this, and go back to, to let's say, to the first, for Adam, the, the, this molecule, all right, who made the water molecule, who made hydrogen. You get to a point where it had to come from someone, and there's nothing before that except God. And and therefore, logically, without even going into any religion whatsoever, you can prove that there is a God. Now keep that in mind for next week when we we start we we go over some of the people you know the the people out there you're going to meet in school who are going to kind of ignore that fact. They, they won't mention it, and, and if you mention it, they'll just say, well, you know, you're prejudiced because your parents raised you that way, and poor kid. You know. So, and then there's some things that you know that you, that, that thinking logically tells you about this God, this person. And we went over those before with, with why bad things happen to good people when we talked about the nature of God. He has to be almighty. If he designed this world, and he created the whole universe, he has to be more powerful than the universe he created. So he has to be almighty. He had to have existed before it. Nothing could have, he is not caused. He's what caused everything, but nothing caused him. So he had to be eternal. He had to exist before it. And he has to, be self-existent. In other words, nothing created him. He has to be a spirit because matter, matter has a length of time. It can only exist for a certain amount of time and then it decomposes. Matter is a, 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 an imperfect thing. He has to be a spirit because everything material is limited and God can't end. Because he has to keep everything else going. So he has to be infinite. He also has to be a spirit. And as a spirit, and having existed before all the world, he has to be um, live, he, outside of any dimension whatsoever. Space, time. So if he's outside of space, he's everywhere. And if he's outside of time, he's always present. And I explained to you how, you know, how God sees, sees things. You see things as the past and the present and the future. God sees everything lined up like this. And he sees it all now. Everything is now. No 
will have to wait till you get to heaven for him to explain how that happened. Because that's the best I can do about explaining it. Um, so anyway, so reason tells you all of this about God without any other. He has a couple extra chairs. We need some. There's some more right here. Um, so without any other uh, religion prejudicing you in any direction, you can tell this much about God, that there is one and pretty much a lot of his attributes. But reason tells you that you have certain obligations to God. You know, that's why it's because your conscience tells you you know, more, something is morally right and morally wrong, so you know you have certain obligations. But reason doesn't tell you what those obligations are. And that's where religion steps in. Religion, besides, besides logic and intelligence, you also have to have, God had to have intervened at some point to tell us what it is that he wants. And that's called revelation. We're not going to go too much into revelation right now. We're just just telling you. We'll get into it a whole lot more later. But right. But what I need for you to understand now is this is where religion comes in. God reveals what He wants, the obligations that He wants you to do, and you have to take that on faith. Faith is accepting the word of someone else. There's two kinds of faith. There's natural and supernatural. Natural faith is when you accept the word of somebody else. You know. All right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow five bucks from you now, and I'll give it to you uh, Tuesday. Uh, and you know, you have to, and we come to an agreement. So. She has to accept on faith that I'm going to pay her on Tuesday, which may be, you know, totally erroneous on her part, accepting, you know, but you have, to, we, in life, we have to accept the faith of other people. Otherwise, there'll never be peace in the world when two countries come together and make a treaty. They have to accept the word of the other country. You have to accept the word that she, you're going to get paid by my, you know, I'm selling you this and you're going to pay me. You have to accept their word for it. So we go through life accepting the with, uh, at face value uh, with faith in other people. And that's natural faith, accepting the word of someone else. Now, supernatural faith is accepting what God tells us. And we accept it because he is God. And he has the authority and he won't lie to us. So if we know that God wants us to do something, accepting what he says is much surer than my accepting that her accepting that I'm going to pay her. Because God can neither deceive nor be deceived. He will not lie to you. You can't lie to him. So it's it's important. Supernatural faith is very important, but and supernatural faith has to become a habit where you constantly it is a virtue. It's a virtue that you received with you know sanctifying grace. And you have to increase in faith. I, I talked about why bad things happen to good people. Sometimes those bad things by your accepting them helps increase your faith. That God is doing this for a reason. And you have to believe that he's doing it for a reason. So philosophy depends upon reason. But religion doesn't depend upon reason entirely. It depends more on divine revelation. And since God can tell us things, since God reveals things to us, our accepting them, we can understand more than what logic can tell us. We know more by our faith about God than what logic can tell us. And we can arrive at it faster by accepting what, what is revealed by God. So Revelation gives us certain facts about the universe that we're not capable of understanding without that revelation. Hmm. There's a trinity, for example. 
certain facts that philosophers can't agree upon. They debate certain issues, and but religion and faith can tell us the answers because again, God has revealed the answers, and they don't have all they don't have all the answers. And it also gives us truth that we'll never know. It's another example is the uh, the Trinity, or that there's two persons in Jesus Christ, uh, two natures in one person, Jesus Christ, a human nature and a divine nature. Again, those are things that logically you can't arrive at. And it also, very one of the, the important things it gives you, it tells you what God wants from you. What acts you have to, to do, to perform, to be pleasing to him. So, important, revelation is really important. It's so, it's, we know that it's important because God made it a point to give us all of this information. And he did it slowly over a long period of time. Not only the fact, the, not only that all the things are revealed in the Old Testament, but he sent his son to give us even more information. He found a church to tell us specifically what we have to do to get into heaven. How, how we can please God. So is Revelation is a very important thing, and you really and again, the revelation is bound to the to religion. So we get to the point that you're going to find out there in the world. It's called religious indifferentism. You know it as the statement you hear all the time. Well, one religion is as good as another. Is it? Is one religion as good as another? No. We're all going to heaven, so how? Do, what's the difference of how, what religion I use to get there, right? No. So, let's just take a look at that. And I want you to, again, use your, your brain box. Think about it. If what you believe is what makes something true, which is what they're saying, basically, if you think about it, one religion is as good as another, so it doesn't matter what I believe, what I think, we're all going to heaven. If that's true, if it doesn't matter what you believe, then if you take that out of the role of religion and put it into real life, it would have looked something like this. Here's a pond, you know, and ice does float, so. Um, you. You say that the ice is five feet thick, and you're gonna bring a sled and go on, a, on it with a sled. But she says that the ice is only five inches thick, but she can, she can skate on it, but no, a horse wouldn't, a horse and sled would definitely fall through. And, and let's see, and she says it's only about half an inch thick, and if you try and skate on it, you're gonna fall through and, you know, maybe drown. So, if it, for you, if you, believe that belief makes something true, then you should be able to drive a sled on it because for you it's five feet thick because that's what you believe. And for her, it's it's five inches thick and she can skate on it, but she can't take a sled. And she can't skate at all because she's going to fall through because what you believe makes the ice that thick. Logically, that's what you should come up with, right? Uh huh? But who is right? Well, well who is right? What happened? Who is right? I don't know. Cause how right. would you Go know who's right? How would you figure out who's right? Um, Go take an axe and take a sled. You and could see what take you an axe and break like through the ice it. and measure it. Exactly. You you use more than just it's, so. It's not just the belief that makes truth is truth. And to find out if something is true, you usually have to experiment or test it. He's breaking through it with an ax and measuring it is testing it. And he finds out that it's five inches thick and they can skate on it, but they better not take a sled. And she's all wrong and she you know, can go home if she doesn't want to skate. <laughs> so, so what's true is true. It's, and, and so when God reveals something, it, there can be no doubt. So if God says that this is the religion you have to follow, 
this is what you have to do, it doesn't matter what all the other religions say. They can, they can go along their merry way and they're, they're like the guys with the, the ice. The truth is the truth. You have, to, you have to find out what is the truth. So, you know, Martin Luther says that everybody can interpret the Bible any way they want. Again, that goes back to that belief. What you believe makes it true. I believe that the Bible says this, and the this person says, I believe the Bible says that. That's why there's so many Protestant religions out there. I've known Baptist religions to break off from, a, from you know, the, there's one whole church, and then they'll interpret one passage of scripture. I remember one group broke off from another Baptist group because they found someone in scripture about women shouldn't cut their hair. And so they they interpreted that very strictly and they broke off because, you know, we're not cutting our hair. You guys cut your hair, so we're not. You guys are all going to hell and we're not. Come on. <laughs> so, um, so you, belief is not, it, it should, isn't the be all and end all of, of what makes something true. Then there's the other, the other part to that. They say, well, but it comes your conscience. You know, you have to obey your conscience. And my, I, I, I've looked into all of these religions, and my conscience tells me this is what I have to believe. What's the problem here? Or is it the devil? Possibly. But you're, you do have to obey what your conscience tells you. You have a moral obligation to obey what your conscience tells you. The problem is that sometimes your conscience is wrong. Your conscience can be wrong because, again, it's, um, it, it's, your conscience is based on reason, and sometimes your reason is faulty. Therefore, your conscience will be faulty. For example, the Aztecs believed that uh, when they won a battle, they could take all of their prisoners and sacrifice them to the God, their god because they, their, that was thanking their god for the victory. And that was morally correct for them because that's they, in conscience, killing those people was not morally wrong because they were doing it for their god. That was an error in thinking. But they weren't culpable because they, they believed that, that they were doing good in that. But look at it the other way. Here's a mother who has a sick child. And she takes a bottle out of the medicine cabinet and she thinks that it's aspirin she's giving the baby. And it's arsenic. Now the mother isn't culpable. She didn't kill the, murder the child. She's not guilty of murder. But the baby's still dead. Morally, if you follow your conscience, you may not be culpable. In other words, when you stand before Almighty God, He may not send you to hell for it. But you still have the results of that error in your conscience, of acting wrongly. I mean, you followed your conscience, but your conscience was wrong. Then there's the case of, the other, of other people, and these are the majority of people. Most people who actually try to find out what is right and what is wrong will find the answer. And they won't have an error in judgment. If they really want to find the right religion and they spend time examining and looking, they will ultimately end up in the Catholic Church. But then there are, there are people who, who have a faulty conscience because of, of selfishness, um, lack of knowledge, they don't, they're too lazy to look for it, prejudice. They, they feel that they're right and nobody else's, you know, pride, whatever. Those, those things, they will twist the conscience, their conscience to suit themselves. 
And in those cases, they are culpable. Because God will judge you, as Bishop Soon says, on the conscience that he gave you, not the conscience you made for yourself. And too many people in this world today are making their own consciences. They want, they're tired of this girl, and they want to marry that one. She's a whole lot prettier and younger. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I know the church says that I shouldn't, you know, I can't divorce, but um, I think they're wrong. Know, and this and they so they do it I can't tell you how many people will say you have in, in my lifetime have come up to me you know and again I'm obviously a Catholic somehow they know that so they they'll say you know oh sister I was a Catholic once and once they say that I could almost pinpoint the exact date and time when they left the Catholic Church and it was usually over something that they wanted the Catholic Church told them they couldn't have a boy or a girl, usually. They, and they would leave the church. That, and they'll say, oh, but my conscience is clear, you know. Yeah, but your conscience is clear because you're going by conscience you made. But deep down, at night, when you really think about it, and certainly at the hour of death, you will be thinking about it. You'll, you'll be thinking back on it and say, I wonder if I was wrong. That's why so many people are afraid when they're talking. Because deep down, you know you're wrong. You know it. That, that guilt is there. And the very fact that those people tell me that I used to be a Catholic means they feel guilty. They do feel guilty. So, in those cases, God will indeed punish them because they are guilty and they are worthy of punishment. So um, think about it and, and, tr and, and use this. Use this. God gave it to you for a reason. And we can manage to convince ourselves. We're very good at talking ourselves out of things. And you have to be careful, though. Your conscience, your conscience is a very sensitive thing, and you should listen to it. Now, don't become scrupulous, and we'll talk about that some other time. Scrupulous is when your, you let your, your conscience become too sensitive, that everything is a sin. In the world we live in today, almost nothing is a sin. Reality is in the middle between those. Not everything is not a sin. Nothing is a sin. Reality is there are there. Think some things are sinful. We need to know the difference between a mortal and a venial sin, and then between a sin and a fault. We're going to go over all of those things so that you understand the difference. But for now, just understand. Yes, your conscience is very sensitive, and you should listen to it. When you stop listening to it, when you start ignoring it, pretty soon it will stop talking to you. It will stop. It's, it's like, you know, so he's not going to listen, so I'm not going to say anything. It's still there, and it will still act up once in a while, you know, if you do something horrendously worse than you've done before. And they say something. But you need to keep that voice inside of you. You can call it your guardian angel. You can call it whatever you want. But it's part of you that tells you when you've done something wrong. You need to keep it alive. Don't twist it. Don't, don't change it. Listen to it. Think about what it says. And act upon it. If you, as long as you continue to act on what your conscience tells you, you should be all right. Especially if you learn, you know, when it's, when, what things are sinful and what things aren't, what things are, are sins, what are faults, and, and once you know that, then your conscience will have much, will be able to guide you much better than it, than prob probably will now. But out there in the world, again, in that pagan world out there, 
they have some really twisted ideas and we buy them all. So obey your conscience, yes, but make sure that it's the conscience that God gave you and not one that you make for yourself. So any questions? Short, short lesson today? Because we get carried away a couple of times, so maybe last, next week will be a little longer. Next week we're going to talk about materialism and um, atheism and agnosticism, so you know the difference, because all three of those are connected and it's out there, actually, actually in here too. Be surprised at how much materialism you've absorbed without being aware of it. It's like living in a poisonous atmosphere and you just breathe in all that poison afterwards. After a while you become so used to it you don't notice that it's bad for you. It's like secondhand smoke or whatever they call it. You get lung cancer but, but you didn't you never smoked in your life because your father smokes as a chain smoker.